So welcome everyone. Welcome to the Agile Lithuania's meetup uh, in collaboration with Danske Bank. So first of all, thanks to Danske Bank for letting us in and hosting it, uh, allowing us to host it here. So my name is Dominikas. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm, a, I'm an Agile coach here at Danske Bank and also I'm a volunteer for Agile Lithuania, helping them to organize these wonderful events. So we have a great lineup for you tonight. Uh, a lot of interesting experience from a product ownership perspective. We have Justa, Sigita, Kristina, Darius, and Justina. Not in that particular order. I'll show the order uh, in a moment. So we'll have a 15 to 20 maximum minute presentations, followed one after another. And after that, we'll have a sort of a Q&A panel. We'll set them all here in front, and you'll be able to ask some questions. I think that's all clear. So. Let's switch the laptops and start with the first one. Hello, everyone. I hope I'm holding the mic in the correct place. So, OK, it's my first time, so my apologies if I don't speak uh, nice in the microphone. So my name is Sigida. I am product owner on mobile pay. Besides of leading products, I also lead people. I am people manager. So some say that it cannot be done. Uh, but I like the challenge. I like leading both people and products. And this is my colleague Justus. He's coming from my team as well. Hey guys, I'm Justus. I'm also a PO for MobilePay. And this is also my first time speaking into a mic. So I also have the wonderful opportunity of hearing my own voice while I speak. So <laughs> hope it goes well. So And uh, Sigita will kick it off and then I'll jump in later. Yes, the left hand. Let's see how it works, because I'm not no lefty. Okay, so today we would like to talk about the art of saying no. Basically, about why do we struggle saying no, and why it is important for all of us. Um, I would like to kick off our talk with a couple of quotes uh, that I read a couple of years ago in Forbes Business. I'm not sure if you read that a lot, but it's really very good source of truth. And these uh, quotes basically say why saying no is important. And those are said by really very powerful men who consider saying no a uh, super important part of their successful life strategy. So the first one is Tim Ferriss. He says that what you don't do defines what you can do. The other one is uh, Warren Buffett. He is the third wealthiest man in the world. And he says that the difference between successful people and really very successful people is that really successful people say no to almost everything. The third one is the guy who is uh, taking care of hiring CEOs all over the world. Actually, he's former CEO of this uh, consultant agency. And he says that we should learn learning how to say slowly yes and quick no. Usually we do opposite, right? Then the fourth one that I wanted to share with you, and most likely you are aware of it, it's Tony Blair, who said that the art of leadership is all about saying no. Yes, it's easy. That is simple. It's all about yes and how we do it. And the fifth one is from this super cool guy. And it has been said uh, 20 years, actually more than 20 years ago. It's in WWDC, and Steve Jobs said that focusing is all about saying no. So this is a couple of quotes why it is important not only for us product owners, but it is considered important in every successful people's life. We have to learn how to say no. <coughs> now, mostly you are aware of the saying that if you want to do something done, you have to ask a busy person to do it. Suppose, however, you are the busy person. Suppose that you are asked continually to do a little bit more, uh, a favor, maybe a quick question. So the real question here, why it is so hard to say no? Why do we struggle? And before we deep dive into the perspectives of aspects of our daily life, being as a product owner, I would like to review a couple of reasons why it is hard from psychological perspective. What psychologists or side people say about that. So uh, the first thing is because we are scared. 
We have a fear of appearing selfish, maybe weak sometimes, and this fear is directing our lives. And uh, we cannot live, we cannot work until our full potential is reached. So that's super important. Uh, we need to deal with that uh, fear that we have. The second one is uh, because we want to be good persons, we want to help. It's really very hard to, uh, at the end of the day to say no if you want to be a good person. But first of all, we need to take care of ourselves. The next one uh, reason is that um, it gives us purpose. It feels so good to help or save somebody and it gives this really awesome feeling of being valuable. So we say yes. The other one is that we need approval. It's really very unhealthy to always seek for approval, but we do that. We say yes because we need or we want to get an approval from somebody else. It could be family member, it could be coworker, or it could be our boss. Perhaps we want to impress. We don't really want to appear as these losers who cannot, you know, do their job, or maybe, we, um, you know, just we are new at some work and then we say yes to everything and then work crazy hours so that we can do everything at the end of the day. Uh, we might also feel obliged. We have been thought from a really very young age that saying no or disagreeing with something, it might be assumed as rude, unpolite, assertive, and even rebellious. So we don't really have any other option just to say yes, because that's what's expected from us. Um, sometimes we also feel guilty. I hope, or at least I would want not to feel that guilty that often, but I do feel. And sometimes I ask myself, you know, why do I feel guilty if I want time and energy for myself, at least a little bit after the work day? And the last that we wanted to share with you is something about avoiding growth. Could it be that sometimes you dedicate your life helping others, coaching, mentoring, giving everything you got just because you are afraid maybe, again, coming back to the first one, or maybe just avoid dealing with your own dreams. So these are the psychological reasons why people usually struggle of saying no. And right now, let's look into the perspective of product owner and how it looks in our daily, daily work. So Justus, here you go. Okay, so how does that all impact us as product owners? So let's start from the beginning. As a product owner, your job is to make the best product that you can. And saying no does not hinder that in any way, shape or form. Saying no makes some stakeholders unhappy. But whoever said that being a PO is an easy job. So you should embrace no as a tool in your tool set. It's a very powerful thing that can help you focus and work on the best thing that you can be working on at the moment. Because as you all know, you know, we have limited resources, limited time, limited capacity, all of that stuff. So you need to say no to nine out of 10 requests because otherwise you'll just be you know, running around in circles and doing the things that are not important. Um, saying yes, of course, as Sigita mentioned, is something that we do love as people. It's easy to say yes, it feels good to say yes. But one thing that people, especially, uh, less uh, less senior people tend to do is they forget that each time that you say yes you inherently say no to something else because as I mentioned you know we have very limited time and if you're working on that great new UI feature you're not working on your I know export function on your database uh, optimizations and stuff like that so you need to think about that and think about the trade-offs that you are making when saying yes as well Another thing that might help you, you know, embrace the no in a easier fashion is you need to think about what type of no are you saying. It's very hard to hear uh, when someone says no, we're not going to do it. But a lot of times it makes sense to, you know, do it at a later date. So inform the people upfront, you know, 
maybe when you finish that high priority thing, you can come back to it and do it later. So there is a very big difference between no and not for now. But don't make the mistake of falling into this trap of using this no, we'll do it later as an easy way out, as an escape. Because another part of your job as a product owner is, of course, building trust uh, with the stakeholders, with your peers, with your colleagues. And taking the easy win today and saying, you know, no, we're not going to do it right now, when you never intend of doing it, it will hinder you in the long run because you're basically, you know, lying to people. <laughs> so um, the more I work as a product owner, I do find myself saying no quite a, mo quite a lot more than I used to. But at the same time, I also find myself being accepted when I say no uh, better. People tend to not argue as much. Don't get me wrong, of course, I do get challenged quite a lot, and that's completely fine. But there's no like emotional responses. There's no arguing for arguing's sake. And I treat that as a sign of growth, that you know I am maturing as a product owner. And I think everyone should strive to be able to, you know, convince people and say and get a convincing no without uh, you know much involvement so i'd like to share a couple of tips and tricks that you can hopefully use in your uh, day to day to help you use no in a more effective manner without offending people so the first one of course is easy for us as product owners especially it comes kind of naturally but sometimes it helps that you when you think about it more so the partial no it makes sense to kind of you don't need you don't need to you know say no to everything you can say no to things that are nice to have and please people but are not really essential so you know if you were to ask me for a pizza and i was to tell you uh, yeah but i can only provide 3 quarters of a pizza you'd be you know pretty happy but if i said you know no you're not getting the pizza you'd be what the f Eustace, where's my pizza man <laughs> you should be working on that so know keep that in mind but don't get into the trap of using it also as an escape so when it doesn't make sense to do anything don't outscope part of it because it's easier and do something that doesn't bring value keep that in mind so another thing that kind of gets overlooked is as product owners we tend to know that a lot of things will not get built even you know from the very start so in the initial ideation phases, especially in, you know, uh, workshops, in brainstorming sessions, we kind of tend to let loose and say, you know, people, you know, all ideas are good, throw them in. And it gives, gives the impression that, you know, everything is possible, where in reality, we already know that that's not true. So be honest and set the right expectations. You know, if there's things that are never making it into your product, just say it up front, because Oh, <laughs> uh, because uh, otherwise, you know, I it's harder for people to hear it at a later date. Of course, don't throw that away. Put it away somewhere. You might need to revisit, you know, things change, all of that uh, good stuff. But keep that, uh, you know, in the back of your mind. Uh, as with a lot of arguments, of course, using data, using user perspective, that helps a lot. And never, ever use I when, you know, arguing for a no. That automatically puts it into an opinion battle. And without data, of course, the hippo will always win out. And uh, you, know, you will have to deal with it. So the last tip that I want to share, or second to last, sorry, is that um, people also tend to make long lists of reasons why we're not doing something over the other thing. And while that kind of seems like a good idea, it's actually not, because if you have 10 reasons, you probably have two good ones and seven or eight that are eh. So people will automatically attack the weakest argument that you give, and it gives them an entry into bargaining mode. So think about the most important reasons that you have and use them instead of making this long list that helps no one. And with, as if with a lot of things, of course, be open on how you made the decisions. You know, it's one thing to hear no, we're not doing it. It's another to know the reasons behind it. You know, if you did, you know, some cost-benefit analysis, if you have some legal requirements that must be met, it's much easier for the person to accept, you know, why something has not been done uh, instead of just hearing, no, we're not doing it. So, you know, that's 
kind of a basic thing, but it sometimes gets overlooked. So these are, of course, just a few tips that you can use in, in your day-to-day, -day, and there's quite a lot more on the internet. You, of course, can hopefully all Google. So, but I want to encourage you, you know, to embrace No as a tool in your uh, next endeavor. Use No, you know, to turn it into a go uh, to achieve your objectives and build the best products that you can build. So just a quick summary before we end. So, you know, saying no is, of course, hard, but don't be afraid of it. It's a very powerful tool. Say no often, practice it, and it will get better, and you will, you know, learn to love it. Use the right no, because there are a couple of, you know, approaches that you can use. And as always, you know, be, be transparent and let people know how you came to the conclusions that you did. Thank you. My name is Darius. I'm lead product owner from Genius Sports. Uh, I decided to take a new job, uh, this opportunity to work at Genius Sports a year and a half ago. And I was in my previous job for 12 years, so it's been pretty significant time that I spent. So you can imagine how I was like fighting with my internal fights. And I, was, I remember that day when I was sitting in the office sipping my morning coffee. And I opened uh, the internet and started to just to read the, uh, uh, the news and was waiting for the lunchtime to go to Genius Sports office to sign the work contract. And literally, this is the article that came on the Basket News site um, the day when I had to go to sign the contract with, uh, with Genius Sports. And definitely I was very attracted by the opportunity to work directly with NBA, <laughs> but I remember myself, I looked at the ceiling and said, Right, God, if you try to send me some sign, it's a nice try. <laughs> I got that. So I definitely started to check the other sites, uh, the global ones, whether that's true. Maybe that's only Lithuanian sites are saying. Um, but the problem is that all the huge global sites have been saying the same thing. The stats system of MBA crashed. And that was kind of like disappointing, although it was pretty funny. <laughs> Uh, I started to read the article and what the sentence actually outlines is, dude, relax, that's not the first time that they have crashed. It's actually uh, maybe the one uh, really severe. So anyways, I emailed my boss and just like ma made it funny and just said, is that the system that I'm going to work on and, and just kind of like help you to finalize because that was th this project was at the end of its phase and, and he goes, yes, that's, that's exactly the one. So that's how we just, uh, we went with the project, making the story fast forward. Now it's a very successful project. MBA made it publicly that this is the best statistical system so far that they have come to. And it then within the team, we, we made the jokes out of these stories that you just saw. We rephrasing uh, internally those phrases like this one into this one where one small issue for NGSS, one giant sleepless night for developer, because when something happens, our developers here in Lithuania <laughs> spending the nights uh, trying not to wake their families and uh, trying to fix uh, the problems that happens um, in arenas. And NGSS stands for NBA Global Stats System. So what it is, it is uh, Lori from Golden State. She's actually using the software that is being built in, uh, on the other side of the river. Uh, this is the software des designed for uh, collecting official game data and distribute that to the downstream consumers, whatever they are. They, they might be ESPN, Fox, whatever. The system looks pretty, pretty simple. Game operations, uh, I mean, the system is quite complex, but uh, the schema is pretty simple. It's game operations where you get all your games, uh, the stats capture, the application, uh, that statisticians are using in arenas and definitely the warehouse where we store all the data. We have our APIs. Everything is in deployed into infrastructure of MBA. And uh, we have all these downstream consumers that are waiting for, uh, for the game data to come and they're just uh, consuming that data. So one part of Genius Sports divisions are uh, doing exactly what we've done with uh, NGSS. We're collecting the tools. We're doing the tools for collecting the official sports data. So uh, 
we, we also try to buy the data rights. When we talk about the data rights, we're talking about the game uh, league data rights. Uh, we talk, we're talking about like the basketball, football, and all these data rights. We also use the contrast strategy to get, uh, to get the data in when we offer it, uh, our consumers uh, the whole suite of products for them to use uh, so that we can get the data. And then we sell it for our own purposes, whatever we want to do that. And we always ensure that the data we collect with our tools is collected very fast, it's very accurate, and at the same time, it's very rich. So fast being fast, accurate, and rich is kind of like the challenge itself, but that's, that's, uh, that's on the mission that we are. This deal with NBA, this successful project, it helped us to uh, unlock uh, the 10 years partnership with NCAA. Who doesn't know, NCAA is a national uh, Students Athletic Association in the United States is very popular. Sometimes it's being said that it's even more popular than those major sports. So my team that I'm working on with NBA, uh, we put that project with NBA into the maintenance support phase. And my team has been assigned uh, a new sport, American football. Uh, sorry, I just didn't mention that. In return to NCA, we have to deliver them the solutions for 10 or up to 10 uh, different sports, including American football, basketball, soccer, whatever. So our team got that American football assigned. Nobody knows, no, nobody has the clue what that is. We already have a deadline. That's a thing that's a nice thing about the deadlines is that I've been also in my previous job, I was in, in situations and in projects where we do our products but we don't have a deadlines. And actually that was, uh, some s deadlines sometimes can be stressful, but not having a deadline makes you really um, hard to reach your goals. And when you have a deadline, which is actually pretty strict, when I'm talking about the deadlines at Genius Sports, you're dealing with the start of the season. You cannot delay the season of American football in NCAA, simply saying that some Lithuanian development company didn't deliver the statistical software for them. So we have the deadline and we are ready for that. We, we just don't understand what we have to do. Uh, NBA doesn't go away. They want still to get the features, but uh, they have really tight schedules. So I'll get into details with that. So all of a sudden we start seeing that kind of elephant. And as a product owner, we have to come with a strategy to understand how we, uh, how we start eating that elephant. And Probably the best answer is bit after bit. So the first bit, what our team made, uh, made a decision, was taking the uh, NBA schedules uh, sorted out. So if that's a timeline throughout the year, that's all these events that, that has NBA throughout the, the year. It's pretty much endless year of events. And when we want to deploy them, a new version of, of their software, and we tried to say, we're going to release here. They say, no, 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 it's, we, we cannot release during NBA playoff because if something happens, it's going to be a disaster. So what we have done, we have decided to split their events and taking our own judgment. We said, all right, the, the green line is the minor events and the red line is, is the uh, major events. And we split those events. And what we started to see is that actually those gaps on, on the lower line that after NBA regular season ends, there's a gap uh, and we're just only hitting the uh, G League regular season. And we actually started to plan those releases here. So we came with this approach to NBA. We said that, hey, we didn't, we've done our homework. We identified uh, the slots for, for the releases. Let's, let's work on the scope. Let's work on, on the features that you want to get. And we get you the software on the right date. They've been very happy about that. And we are using the same approach here. And the last example was right after NBA's finals. We had these two nice gentlemen. And what it means, it means that one release was pending just a couple weeks ago. And we all thought that the finals will end four to nothing. Oakland will win. The first game, Toronto wins. Ah, shit, it's going to be five games final. Yeah, and the second game just proves it. But what happens then, it's already three to one. And, uh, you know, we hate Raptors, not simply because that they traded Volanchunas, but simply because that it's going to, to be a seven final game uh, for uh, Warriors to win. And then they won this, uh, the fifth game. We then started to hate Warriors because they, by prolonging the NBA finals, they just making the gap for us to release uh, a more narrow. And actually we just like, all right, it's going to be a really small, 
small gap, so let's you know just be whatever that is. And we know how it ended. It just so Raptors uh, won in the sixth game. All right, so back to American football. So we deployed, actually, um, NBA is set on a good course, and we need to, to work uh, with the American football. Uh, we need to start gaining the domain knowledge, understand what that is. And again, maybe that was another sign, but uh, two weeks before the project kickoff, there's actually a game between two Lithuanian American football teams right like 200 meters away from our office in Fane Stadium. And Kona's Dukes playing Iron Wolves. We took that approach to the stadium, we watched the game, and then uh, we invited Godrus. Uh, he's the enthusiast and the, the very first guy who actually so uh, actively talked, started talking about American football into our office. And he brought some of the Iron Wolves team. And uh, these guys been taking uh, and explaining uh, ins and outs of American football as much as they could in two or three hour session. Uh, so the lessons that I learned from here were, was that whatever you, you do, whatever the industry you're working on, take your development team on the field trip. Take it, you know, if you're working in a construction company, take it to construction site. If you're working in insurance, go to the insurance brokers and just try to understand what they do. It really helps and makes the entire team really committed. All right, so the challenges that we got with American football was that this is the field, the 100 yards length field. And what we have to do with our applications, we have some, some certain rules what we have to do. Uh, we need to record what happened, where it happened, and who did it. So three things. So right here with, uh, with, the, with these yards, we, we are dealing with double digit yards. We're dealing with double digit uh, jersey numbers. I'll come in a second. Uh, we still don't know whether or not the problem is, <laughs> but in American football, they have split the field into two parts. It's team A's 0 to 50 and team B's 50 to 0 field. So by adding the yard line, whatever that, uh, whatever that is, we need to say which, uh, which team side that is. So for us, it, it's additional mouse click or stylus click on, on a screen, and it makes our life tougher for being fast. So. Another problem that we have, this is, by the way, the picture from Gabriel Seunishkis, a young photographer who is working for a lot of media companies here as well. He went to Indiana, and we organized them uh, a Division Three game uh, with the Wabash College and Alany. What you can see here, the red guys are Wabash College. The NCAA doesn't limit how many players can be on, on, on the team, so they have 300. So they, they are taking entire trains to the game. And on the other side of the field, <laughs> these 50 guys, they are Alany College. <laughs> so the problem is when you have 300 players on, on, the, on the team and NCA's requirement to have only double digit numbers, we end up having players with the duplicate numbers. It might be two players on, uh, and actually that was the game where, where we had two 55s on the, on the field on the same play. So what we started to do and here's, the, uh, here's one of the samples. It's not from that game. But here's a tackle. Number 15 was tackled at yard line 20 by number 9. Uh, I can already tell you this is already 17 clicks by our initial design that we thought. It's way, 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 way too much uh, to get that data in uh, in that way. So we started to think and started to iterate. Our initial concept of the application looked like <laughs> we made that fantastic numpad that we've been internally calling calculator. Uh, and we said like Clemson or Alabama, the field size, and we are adding the yard line. Then we iterated next. Then we thought some, some idea came in that we, what if we just implement a line of the field where actually if you put with the mouse on some specific uh, area of that yard line, you will get the yard line that you actually aimed, and we just load five additional yards to one side and five additional yards to the other side. And it's actually two clicks and you get the, the right yard line. So we took that approach, but actually some of our team, including, including some, some, some UX people, they, they kind of like started challenging us uh, to say that maybe calculator is still better. So what we have done, we made another fantastic decision. We, 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 hid it, we made the calculator hidden. So when you put on the input field, the calculator pops up, you get the yard line, but you, we still want to make that as a primary data input. So what we have done next, uh, we gave that 
uh, we gave that approach uh, to our users and let them test. And we just asked what approach uh, they like it better. And we end up having removing the calculator forever. Uh, we just have this yard line above. They just uh, entering the yard lines in two clicks. And the same method we use for the players. So we have those groups here from 1 to 9, from 10 to 19. So if you're looking for the player 25, you click on 20, 29 bucket. It's one click. And you're finding number 25 in the bucket. It's another click. So as you can see, we also tackled uh, double digit problems, sorry, not the duplicated number, where you have 222 numbers and the statistician can very accurately get that uh, sorted out. So actually, w the workflow with sev 17 clicks was narrowed down to six. In a, in a very good case, we can, we can come to four clicks. So that's what, what we are talking about, the speed of data. And no matter how creative you are as a product owner, you, you are wearing different hats. Sometimes you are user uh, researcher, uh, you are designer, but we need to go uh, to get the approval from our uh, design, design team. And sometimes these are my mockups that I was thinking about how we can get that, uh, eliminate the clicks. And sometimes the reaction, I hate GIF, GIFs on, on my presentations, but really, literally, that was the reaction sometimes from our UX people when I just show them uh, my wonderful designs. <laughs> so, and again, no matter, <laughs> this is the last slide, so uh, no matter how many hours you spend watching the YouTube, no matter how many hours you go and talk to Iron Wolves and asking what is the touchback, what is the uh, pass interference, you end up swimming with sharks. Those sharks are people in US uh, doing uh, American football scouting for 30 years. And you coming from Lithuania on a conference call and saying, hey, I know how to make your life easier. Sometimes it can be scary, like swimming with sharks. And there's no lessons to learn. I mean, if you, if you survive, you become stronger. If you die, you probably was on a, not the right job. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. OK. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina and I'm business analyst uh, from Danske Bank uh, Group IT. And I'm working in wealth management uh, unit and uh, currently I'm working on a project where we are developing a pension solution both for web and mobile app. And today my speech would be um, uh, about some takeaways uh, from my advanced CSPO uh, certification I took earlier this year. And so that, uh, it, that would be much easier for you to understand and for me to explain uh, the tools I'm going to share with you today. Uh, I have prepared some example, which could be our business case uh, today. So, a summer has already started and right now we have the last uh, meetup before vacation or summer vacations. I thought that um, let's take as an example something related with vacation, trip, traveling. So our business case uh, today would be building some online platform for renting a car, right? Where uh, some vendors could uh, post their proposals with some suggestions about the cars. Somebody can look or search. Uh, and uh, another part would be for that uh, customers who are going uh, on a trip and looking for some car uh, to be rented there. And uh, the first tool I'm going to share with you, uh, which could be used um, to start thinking about uh, the first steps uh, for building your own uh, product. Uh, that would be a so-called strategic steps canvas and uh, this tool is pretty simple one so basically that could contain the three columns there I hope the ones in the back would see something yeah so and uh, this strategic step canvas is f used for uh, defining some specific steps for you as a strategy from where you would like to start because probably you won't be building uh, the huge uh, some product in our case uh, some uh, online platform for renting a car but maybe you can start thinking about the smaller slices there so you can start with uh, having the first like slice where first col column is uh, defining or identifying your target group 
or a market you would like to target as a first step. Then in the second column, uh, you would be thinking about some learnings. So it means what you can learn by delivering or implementing your product for that specific tar target group. What you can learn about that market and, and uh, product here. And uh, the last part here or column stands for offering. What would you over offer for your end users? So, uh, if uh, getting back to our case where we have online platform for car renting, uh, as a first step, strategic step could be that let's say our target good, uh, group would be uh, young travelers, right? Then the second one could be probably families, etc. So, what you do by using that strategic steps canvas, you're just simply uh, writing down, slicing into the steps here. And continuing with the first step, step here, where we have uh, our target group, which are young travelers, what would we learn with that first step? So as we still don't have any platform, online platform, uh, to rent a cars, so basically that would be that we will learn, can we build uh, some platform at all, where we will be giving some opportunities for car vendors uh, to post their proposals and where uh, travelers would be able to search for the cars they would like to rent for their uh, trip. And um, another learning could be that also we will learn and understand better our young travelers and what their needs are. So by using this strategic steps canvas, you just filling in the steps, the target groups, the learnings for the first step, for the second step with target group, etc. And uh, the last part here I didn't cover, so that was offering. So what we would offer in each step for each target group? So in our case, that would be that uh, there would be some platform offering a simple and easy way to rent a car, right? So, easy and simple way to rent a car. So, by having these columns here in strategic st uh, steps canvas, uh, you're filling in as much steps as you can think about. And uh, the next tool I'm just switching to would be something related with the first step you would start with. So right now we have identified our strategic steps here, and the first step uh, are young travelers. And uh, by identifying that, uh, I'm just moving on to the next tool we can use uh, for finding the first slice, would be so-called feature mining. And um, this technique could be used for making or finding the first slice not only uh, on the basis that I just want something or I just need something because because I need, etc. Uh, but it's about having also the four sections there. And uh, the first one stands for value. We're just uh, having in mind that our business case is online platform for renting cars and our first strategic step is uh, to build uh, a product which would be used or targeted for young uh, travelers, what uh, value we can think about for them. So you just simply start writing here that you can search for a car, filter, uh, make a reservation, uh, make a payment, etc. So you're simply just listing down and writing down as much possible values you can think about. Then the next uh, column here stands for uh, for size, where you just list down something uh, what can impact the size of your product you are building in. So in our case, uh, when it comes to car renting, so the size could be defined uh, by a number of vendors or our partners, uh, which will provide uh, cars for us. Yeah. Uh, what else could uh, it could be or define the size? So that could be how many point of uh, rental we would have, right? So then we also write down it here. 
and etc. If you will think about, about some more examples here, you just keep writing down it here. Then going forward, uh, the next uh, section here uh, would be risks. And uh, another part, the lower one, stands for uncertainty. So here as well, just keeping in mind that uh, we are building an online platform for renting a card uh, for young millennials, what possible risks could be there? So the first idea coming uh, to my mind is just high price for insurance probably, right? High insurance uh, price there, but it's important there. Then, as well as with other parts there, you just start list li listening, uh, listing down the possible risk you can think about. And the same stands for uncertainty. So if you have some open questions or unclarities, or you don't have some questions at the moment now, just can list down some questions there. And um, another part about the having uh, the product or building it, always probably you will hear that uh, stakeholders would say that we want everything at once and probably yesterday, but now, but uh, that doesn't happen. And you just start from something. So this future manning technique uh, could help you to finding this the first slice that could be in your case like MVP. So here by answer answering the, the question, for the value. So which ones items I listed down here would give the, m the most value or benefit to our end user there? And then you just start picking them here and that would make your first slice probably you would start with and which would define your like MVP. I hope you know that abbreviation, right? And also you should answer to the question about the size. Which one size listed here is quite big, but probably uh, will require less effort to be that done, right? So uh, maybe to make it ready or have a lot of point of rentals with less cars would uh, require uh, a lot of effort and won't be so beneficial as maybe less point of rental, but a high number of uh, partners or vendors uh, we are giving here. So, etc. And the same stands with uh, the risk. So you should identify which risk would be, uh, or which risks will impact you the most or your product the most. And then you start uh, working on that risk and finding a solution or mitigation plan how to do that. So by using that uh, tool here, uh, you can make the first slice, which will be the MVP of your tool. So in our case, that would be some online platform for renting a car uh, where we're targeting for young uh, people. So we have strategic steps. We have our first slice done here. And let's move to the last tool uh, I would like to share with you. So, so that, uh, that product or that MVP would be successful and done, uh, we, can, we should know uh, with whom we need to collaborate and work together. So the last tool uh, I would like to share uh, would be, uh, sorry, stakeholders map. Stakeholders map. So it's really important to know with whom you should uh, collaborate and communicate just to make your product available and be delivered to your uh, users, end users. And how you use that? So you just simply draw some circles there. And this circle stands for frequency of uh, interaction there. And then you just slice into three parts there. And that uh, map uh, is split into three parts, as you can see. And in one part, later on, we will fill in with uh, stakeholders who would be saying what needs to be done. Uh, another part where we would place stakeholders who would answer the question, how? And the last one, when? So just getting back to our example, if we have some online platform for renting a car, so who can be our stakeholders? So probably that would be uh, our vendors, then some uh, customer support, 
then of course uh, when it comes to rent and insurances we will need help from legals uh, some also IT department who would be building that etc so we're just listing down all these uh, stakeholders we have and start placing them into each part here so as I mentioned here we have the uh, frequency of iteration and based on our project or on our situation the frequency could change so somebody of you can have that you would have some uh, stakeholders you interact on daily basis but let's take an example what we that we will have um, the weekly uh, iteration then monthly and then quarter right so then I'm taking the, the vendors, so somebody who would be providing me a cars to be rented uh, for young people uh, using online platform. So probably that would be somebody saying what he's going to provide, which cars, and probably it's enough to, to have it uh, interaction with them on quarterly basis. So then we place that stakeholder here, right? Then the next one, uh, let's take the legal department. So maybe that would be enough that with legal department you would interact on monthly basis and these people would say probably what needs to be updated based on some legal requirements or compliance, etc. cetera. Um, another example, some uh, IT department uh, who would be building your online platform, platform et cetera, so that could be some IT tech lead. So maybe with these persons you would interact on weekly basis and these would be people who say how to implement that. So then you just place this IT department stakeholders in that map there. So when, okay, so we, we have the missing when part, but in that uh, case probably we can have some uh, stakeholder as a sponsor who is paying for that. And probably he has, uh, uh, he can say when he wants to have something. So maybe with some sponsor or stakeholder from one section, uh, we would be interacting on uh, quarter quarterly basis there so when you have listed all your stakeholders and placed here you have a map uh, where you can make a visible it with whom and how often you can interact and that can be used not only to identify with whom you can inter should interact but also uh, this tool sometimes can help that with somebody you interact too often or to less, so then somebody can be moved from the this circle to the upper or lower, etc. Okay, so then summarizing all these three tools I shared with you here, so you can see that we start with strategic steps where we identify for whom we would like to build our project there, and taking that first slice here, we start finding uh, the features and slicing the first slice. And to make that happen, we just make a list with whom we need to work so that would happen and our end users will benefit from that. Okay, so that was all. Thank you. Hi, my name is Justina. I come from Adform. I'm a senior technical product director. Yes, product director. And what do you guys think of the most two two most popular questions I get when I meet somebody new and they learn that I'm a product director. Who wants to take a guess? Sorry, louder? Was it uh, what do I do? Yes. And what's the second one? Nope, not the difference, but basically it's how did I get there, right? So today's presentation here is about how did I get there? Not exactly me, but basically trying to dissect what is the career path of a product owner and the career path in particular that we built in that from. So without further ado, um, this is basically the career path for product owners we have in Adform. It starts with uh, entry-level position as we treat it of business analyst, then it moves to technical product manager positions, which we have with three seniority levels. And for making clear about terminology we, we use in Adform, so basically technical product manager is equal product owner in Adform. And then we have product director, so people like me. 
So this is definitely not the path I went through. When I started eight years ago <laughs> working in product management roles in Adform, we didn't have product directors and we didn't have business analysts. We simply had product managers who did it all and much more beyond that. But it's not about me. Let's look into what we have now and try to deep dive in each of these roles and see how do we interplay into this career path. What is the progression and what do we as a company see? What competences is needed? What do we expect from persons in each and every role to be able to progress to next step? So first of all, business analyst, a nice looking guy. So <laughs> This is what we treat in that from an entry level position for product management career path in general. And why is that? Well, basically, while working in this role, uh, guys, business analysts have focus in conducting business analysis and in general uh, building analytical thinking. However, we have a perfect opportunity while not, you know, being in a position to prioritize things, to do this really tough job of staying no to the stakeholders, we actually start building the business domain knowledge and product knowledge, meaning product to which we are assigned, as well as form basic knowledge of product management activities, such as writing user stories, prioritizing them, uh, managing stakeholders, and so on. And all those things are really key to being success successful and basis basically for being su successful in product management roles. Next step would be junior technical product manager. Again, product owner in Adform. So those guys in Adform already owns uh, and drive small products or backlogs. And from development perspective, it means that we fulfill product owner's responsibility for a single development team. These guys in fulfilling this role become subject matter experts for that particular product we are assigned to and also gains already broader domain perspective uh, of business domain that Adform operates in and uh, uh, also knowledge of how the product that we are driving and owning integrates with other products in Adform because in Adform we have really many things. Um, also, these guys are expected to, while working in junior technical product management uh, position, to form basic knowledge of product management discipline and basic knowledge of how to apply its best practices as known in the industry. Next step is to move to regular position. So we just call it technical product manager. These guys, as opposed to junior positions, we all already what we call re regular products, so kind of medium-sized products, and they expected to fulfill PO role for one, actually more development teams. Uh, as opposed to junior role, where basically we are building the subject matter expert knowledge in that particular small product we are working on, so basically being able to answer very detailed questions on functionality and capabilities, these guys already expected to have a much broader pro product perspective so that we are able uh, to work in cross-functional team setups with marketing, with client support, with salespeople, in activities such as pre-sales, client meetings, and so on and so forth. And also these guys, through working in regular position, they're gaining broader perspective of multiple products in Adform. So basically already understanding how the ecosystem interplays, how a different offering in buy side, sell side advertising are connected. Uh, also, regular guys are expected to demonstrate robust practical knowledge of product management discipline and best practices and not only keep it to themselves anymore, not only apply it to their own work, but actually to be able to go out there and share this knowledge with their colleagues. Next up is senior technical product manager. And as opposed to the previous roles, these guys are really tough. They already own large or multiple products and backlogs, and they are definitely expected to fulfill PO responsibilities for several, at, le at least two or more uh, development teams and manage multiple backlogs. They 
these guys are the black belts who are driving uh, really complex business cases, really figuring out questions for the business cases that go beyond um, you know, their product area that they are typically working on. And basically, from development perspective, that implementing those would require a high number of development teams to collaborate together. Um, then these guys are normally seen as sparring partners and uh, first go to support persons for product directors when we are building new business cases for implementation. These guys normally maintain and expect at least to gain in this position an advanced knowledge of product management and best practices. So not only through their experience working in this role, but really look outside of that, from outside of our, our companies. What are new things in this craft? What are new things in product management that other companies supply? And bring this knowledge back, right? And also they are expected to proactively share this knowledge, again, not keeping it to themselves and applying to their work only, but sharing it with their colleagues inside Adform, in some ca cases also being active in the community of product management in their country. So going on site and sharing uh, this knowledge in events like that. Um, so last but not least, uh, senior technical product managers are expected to be role models in Adform for other technical product managers and proactively invest their time in mentoring them. And next step would be a product director. So what do these guys do? Product directors are owning large product areas, so not particular products anymore and not working directly with specific development teams. These guys are the ones who are responsible for defining and owning product strategy, product goals and objectives. And they are also responsible, the vast majority of their, their time is actually going into uncovering new business cases, new product opportunities, and uh, mm, bringing them for, stu for discussion to senior stakeholders in order to show those opportunities to basically sell them, to get support, to get buy-in so that they get implemented. And also, product directors collaborate a lot with technical product managers when it comes to building product roadmaps. So to summarize, again, the career path of product managers in Adform starts with business analyst as entry level position to that path, it goes to technical product managers in three seniority levels, and product managers basically are covering product tactical implementations and area. And then next step is product director, which is covering and responsible product strategy field mostly. Through this career path, what we are looking basically from business analysts to technical product managers to product directors through this growth in profession and professionalism, we are looking for people to become more advanced and capable to manage more complex products. So whether in their size, in their difficulty, in number of dependencies, or actually in multiple number of products. We also are looking for growth in functional excellence. So really knowing what are the best practices of product management, how to apply them to different cases, what are the methods and different tools out there, and not trying to make the one fit all the cases, but actually actually looking and trying adaptably see what makes sense in each and every different case. And also very much not keeping this knowledge and this functional excellence to themselves, but as we see product managers grow in their roles, we very much expect them to externalize this knowledge, meaning to share best practices, to share uh, the knowledge we have gained through this path with their colleagues inside the company or even outside. Thank you. That was it. We'll open up with a question from the audience. So if anyone has something burning that you would like to be answered, please raise your hand. Okay, we have one there in the end. Do you want to try to shout? I mean, it's not a burning question, but it would be to the NFL guy. Um, yeah, my question would be, you said you had a deadline. Uh, to make the NFL thing happen, so what 
was the deadline? I mean, how much time did you have? I already asked you, and you answered me that you have no expertise in the field, and you almost had none uh, expertise in your team, and you only had like two hours each day to uh, ask the questions about it. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I guess just to fulfill your question, you asked after the session, like how we get the domain knowledge. So the answer is our colleague is NFL statistician. He's in the Annapolis called statistician, and uh, he also works as a business analyst in our company. So we meet with them regularly, in, especially in the beginning of the project. We met with, with him daily. We've been spending hour, two hour sessions because like if you're dealing with something that you don't understand, spending like three hours is just simply useless. Uh, we have deadlines. Uh, the deadline is for 2020 August uh, next season. This season that is approaching right now, the student season starts at August every year. So this August that is approaching, we are going with shadowing, so called. So we're gonna give the software to those colleges that they want to test, and they're going to have their official legacy system that they're using right now. And we going to. Um, to get an, another stat crew working with our systems and we're gonna get the feedback and we're gonna implement and ready those changes for the uh, official product launch in next year. Good, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yep. Lady in black. Lady in black. <laughs> Okay, so two questions to two ladies. I can start answering. Uh, so the most important thing is not to be the people manager for your developers, right? So that's the rule number one, so I'm not. I'm a people manager for POs and designers, so they are working with other scope that I'm working. Of course there are some clashes, but I think we are, uh, we are finding our ways uh, how to deal with it. And to me, uh, people manage is super interesting. People are complicated, products are not, trust me. Products are easy, I can learn about the products. But people are complicated and that attracts me. And at the same time, I feel that there is ex that experience where you can use in both, in product and people, like the management, maybe scoping some things, advising. And I especially like to be uh, the manager for other product owners, uh, not being the fake manager, but actually doing the same job at a daily basis myself. This is the reason why I can practice myself, I can be the hands-on, and I can advise, I can mentor people, and I can really understand their pains because I'm struggling with the same things. So to me, it's important to actually not just uh, uh, talk, but actually walk the talk. Mm -hmm. There's very little to add what she said. I mean, definitely not for developers, it's a conflict in itself, but being people manager for your peers, basically more junior product manager roles, this definitely opens the gate to understanding, to sharing and to mentoring and only growing those new talents because you have gone through this path yourself and as you said, you understand their pains very much, very well and basically also can employ all the knowledge you have gained directly, you know, po not posing but uh, sharing it with them and this is really a very, very good uh, example of how product uh, management organizations could be set. Good, so I'll take one from the uh, app, the one with the most votes. Where is the line between PO, product owner, and the project manager roles, and es especially within a startup? But we can maybe talk generally, line between project manager and product owner. Any volunteers to start this? Yeah, go ahead. Well, to the part that it's especially in startups, I think in startups uh, there are traditionally very few people. So, of course, there are no strict separation between roles. Everybody is doing a little bit of, you know, multiple disciplines and so on. But in general, to me, the differentiator between project manager and product manager is that 
time uh, aspect to those two things, being product and project. So a project, the mindset basically, there's a start, there's something I need to do within budget and time, and that's the end, and that's it. I move to a s to next thing, right? This is project management. Product management, it's a little baby. We are talking about product which you want to, well, live forever, to be honest. And it has product life cycle, right? So some products also die, but this is, normally in successful cases a very long period of time so you never think that next month I'll be done I'll hand this over to somebody and that's it there's no such thinking because we are always as product manager thinking okay what can I improve what can I do next how to push this to another level and so on and so forth so to me those are the key things Okay, well answered, no additional comments. Another one from the audience, maybe? Okay, so I'll read one from uh, the app, and if you come up with something, raise your hand, we'll take it. Um, maybe you want to, just us. Uh, can you give some real life examples where saying no has created obvious results, benefits? I hope you don't mind I address you, th this particular one. Um, okay, so obviously I'm not sure how much I can share, <laughs> but uh, the most obvious example is uh, just quite recently we had a scoping meeting uh, where the initial kind of list of requirements and, and features was like, I don't know, 15 bullet points or something like that. And uh, having a deadline that was a couple of months away, we basically threw out half of them with the intention of revisiting them after a while so at uh, the middle of the next quarter when we kind of came back to the stakeholders saying you know hey guys so we have this backlog can we you know now revisit this do you need this and for half of them the answer was nope no need so it kind of you know illustrates that when you ask people openly what you want it's kind of you know they just shout out all the ideas but in reality, when they start using the product, learnings come in, and you know it's a, a very obvious, you know, example where costs have been saved. Sorry, that wasn't probably a very sexy answer. <laughs> I was thinking about that. You know, scope management is kind of you know s something that we are expected to do every time to say no to some things. Be clear about that and uh, that's super important but also the other part that i'm dealing with on an everyday basis is not to go too fast to the solution mode we are really very good with solution modes but i ha somebody especially from business here coming to me and saying how the ui should look like come on guys we do have the experts on that and we will figure that out would you please uh, tell me what is the problem or how can I help you, especially if there are other stakeholders we are talking about. So usually I'm really very good in saying, no, not at this time, let's not go to the solution. Let's first of all, all of us understand the problem right, then we can do with all the yeses and nos afterwards. So uh, the long story, spend some time in the problem mode. Don't go too fast in the solution mode. That's going really to help. Good, thank you. Question from the audience, any hands? I have plenty of them here, so. All right, so another one uh, around the split or maybe share of responsibilities between PO and BA. So how do you share or split responsibilities between a uh, business analyst and a product owner? Anyone keen to start this off? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> probably so probably there is no one uh, correct answer to that because it could depend from project to project or pr from product to product and uh, uh, depends also on the setup you have. So it could be in some products maybe you even won't have any BAs uh, as such. So then you would have a product owner who would cover all the activities uh, which covers and um, product backlog management and etc. And then also the BAs activities as well. 
And in other cases, if you have uh, a split of these roles and you have a separate person dedicated as a product, uh, product owner and BA, then it's also probably just uh, an agreement uh, between these uh, persons, who is doing what, etc. And for that uh, also you can use uh, some tools how to define who is doing what. But basically product owner would be responsible for a product, for a vision, uh, in which direction we are going on. And business analyst is the person who is looking into more details and uh, clarifying and identifying the, the backlog and fulfilling with some details. Okay, thank you. Anyone to add anything? Happy with the answer? Okay, good. All right, another question from the young gentleman there. Who should manage the backlog? Yeah. Is product owner. Uh, so the issue is that you know it's okay for the whole team to manage the backlog from time to time and to know what's under it. Mm -hmm. But the most important, as I already mentioned at the beginning, who says no and who says yes? You know uh, what comes to the backlog and w where's the, um, for example, release deadline? Where do we cut? But if business analyst knows what they are doing, and usually there is the secret, you know, that business analyst converge to product owner. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I don't really see any issue. As long as you know what you're doing and you are comfortable with that, and uh, I all the time invite you to become the master of my backlog. I would, li I would like, you know, to use someone who is helping me. But um, the idea is here that if it works for you, that's totally fine. There shouldn't be by the book. It should work in the first place for you and your team. But the book answer was correct. <laughs> Good answer, yes. So if you're willing, come and manage their backlogs. <laughs> um, okay, any more questions from the audience? Okay, I have one, my question from myself. So how do you coach a junior product owner who recently started that particular uh, career path? How, how do you do that? Any takers? Well, how do you coach anybody, right? So at least in my world, coaching is about not uh, coming with answers, right? But it's about, first of all, seeing what questions that particular person or individual has, despite the role, right? And looking for the best way how to support that person, what I can do as a coach, as a mentor, uh, to support that person into finding the answers that could work for him or her in person, right? So of course it sometimes go to sharing some, you know, examples from the past, maybe some, you know, knowledge again, but coaching is not about implying what worked for you on another person. I definitely agree and maybe I would like to add that coaching is also very much helping that other person or experienced person to figure out what uh, it's his or her strengths. That's that's the you know story. You know, if we're talking about mentoring, of course it's about tools, mm -hmm. techniques, about some stuff that you actually need to learn, maybe some practice that you would like uh, to shadow that person or ask questions. But if you coach actually that person, you need to figure out you know what are the key strengths of this particular person, and um, yeah, just uh, find that personal connection. I believe that's the most important. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, one there. Oh, I can actually pass the mic to you now. So we in addition to that, so what if that person is not asking any questions? So how to get that personal touch? Or I don't know how to get that connection. So there is junior people, I mean, he's confident enough and he's not asking any questions. I mean, you, you, you have to coach him, but he is confident enough. So how to deal with that? <laughs> I've been coaching for a while now, you know, so of course there are these kind of persons. Uh, but the matter is you need to find the way. You need to kind of sit down and talk to each other, uh, crack that, you know, 
uh, egg or wherever it is and to figure that out and to be honest if you sit as a coach and listen to people you will reach that point pretty quickly you just need to figure it out for example i was uh, working really very closely with Trimantas. He, he is over there so he can add my maybe a couple of words after but uh, we were trying multiple approaches we tried to work like uh, in peers uh, then i left him then he didn't really come with uh, enough of questions and to me if people don't really have questions i'm worried people have to have questions if they are starting learning something so then we did this uh, scheduled meetings that we meet in the evening in the mornings you know i'm not a morning person so he is avoiding me in the morning but anyways like we find our way how we co uh, collaborate because the most important thing you know to help each other i believe and also by coaching others you learn a lot yourself so it's a mutual connection it's not one-way street never forget that and basically you uh, as a coach you have to master you know through time you get to the person quicker and quicker and quicker experience anything to add nope. i bet that you coach some people <laughs> Okay, what's the most difficult part of managing the product backlog? Where's the key difficulty in there? I know it's uh, <laughs> quite uh, situation dependent i would say so you know sometimes you have a backlog that's you know very straightforward and it's basically just do things in order the complexity comes in when you have you know complete conflicting deliveries conflicting uh, stakeholders and conflicting uh, release dates so of course you know people have you know strengths in in different areas so some of you might disagree but i know to me probably the hardest uh, part is uh, when you have a product launch that's you know multi team dependent and there's a lot of you know different stakeholders so getting that release date in check and ensuring that everything is you know done in the correct order so people can work on things that they can work on uh, that they need to work on sorry and you know to meet the actual uh, deadline of the release uh, so that's probably the coordination part especially in a multi team situation And uh, maybe from my experience, the hardest part of uh, when it comes to backlog management, uh, when you have only one backlog and more than one team is working on that, right? So, and uh, maybe it could be also that uh, that product uh, uh, on which you are working, uh, it's not only the one channel, but more. Then it comes to a complexity dimension one also, when you need to align uh, what all the teams uh, would be working on and then the deliveries for uh, different uh, channels so that would be aligned etc so when it comes to multiple uh, teams then we have another complexity when uh, when it comes only to one team and one backlog yeah. to me when i was managing backlog i think one of the hardest way again only backlog related uh, was keeping it really short so i had the rule to myself not to have it longer than my two screens because otherwise there is a high chance i have crap in it that i had to say no in the first place and then once you put it in it's hard to delete right so for me it was really something i needed to work with myself first of all of saying no not to put things in the backlog and then cleaning up the rubbish that accumulated due to me saying yes too much Okay, so yeah, we're at 8 o'clock, so thank you very much, panelists. Let's give a round of applause.